Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. I'm really delighted to be here tonight, and um, it's been fun to be here so far and meet with some of the William & Mary students. Um, I have to say that um, I, um, I, I think it speaks highly of you that when you chose a vice president for health and wellness a year or so ago, you picked a guy from, from Duke. Um, I'm not going to ask anyone about um, basketball loyalties. I think I might be a little bit outnumbered in this room. But um, I'm also really delighted that at this Veritas Forum that the organizers who put this together wanted to talk about anxiety and depression. These are not easy things to talk about. And uh, the fact that this room is so full is, I think, a marker of how important they are. They're also not exactly rare things to talk about. So um, it's not like every now and then somebody on a college campus might get depressed or gets a little bit anxious. Um, it's not like every now and then somebody might, might, might have feelings like things are not going very well. These are, are really common kinds of things. But there's a national study called the National College Health Assessment that is published every couple of years. And uh, I wonder if you all can guess uh, what percentage of this national survey of undergraduates, people exactly like you, and for those of you that are undergrads, in colleges across the country, answer to a few survey questions. One would be, uh, what percentage of, of undergraduates do you think said that they felt so depressed that it was difficult to function within the last year, within the last 12 months? Any guesses? 30, 40, 50. You guys are really good. It's 31.3% said that they felt, that was, that was impressive. Yeah, exactly. I was expecting like somebody actually to be wrong. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> what about, how many, how many people do you think endorsed overwhelming anxiety at some point in the last year on this survey? You guys are really good. It was 51% in this survey. What about a uh, percentage of undergraduates who, in, who said that over the last 12 months they had seriously considered suicide? Good. These are, these are about right. So in this survey, it was 7.4%. It is a survey, and so there's, that's likely an underreport of numbers. But that's a lot of people. So if you look around, this room it has about 300 or so people in it. If you look you know, kind of around, one out of every two people in this room on average has experienced overwhelming anxiety in the last year. About one out of every three has experienced depression to where it was difficult to function. And about one out of every 13 or 14 has seriously considered suicide within the last year. That's about 20 or 30 people in this room right now. Those are pretty significant and serious numbers. And I think the first thing I want to say tonight is that if that is you, if you are in that moment right now maybe where you're experiencing overwhelming anxiety or where you're feeling so depressed that it's difficult to function, then know that you're not alone, that there's others actually in the room that are experiencing the same things that you are. And don't, don't actually ignore that. There's people here at William & Mary who want to come alongside you and help you. There's people all around you who want to do that. So, so reach out and get help. I came tonight not just, though, to talk about ways in which uh, depression and anxiety are common on college campuses like Duke and William & Mary, and not just to encourage people to seek help, although that's a really important part of what I came to do, but also to think about how does the Christian story, this, this strange story that some of us inhabit that speaks of a God who loves the world and loves us enough to join himself with us in the person of Jesus Christ, what does this story have to say to those of us who experience depression and anxiety and how we walk alongside those who experience depression and anxiety? And if there's one theme regarding that, related to that, it's the same as I just said, that you're not alone. In this case, it's not just that you're not alone because there's other people in the room that are experiencing similar kinds of things, but you're not alone because the God of the universe who created you knows what it's like to be anxious and to be depressed and loves you in that space and joins you in that space and wants to, to draw you into his body and his life and eventually into his joy. 
That's basically what I want to say tonight. Before I get more into that, though, I want to talk a bit more about this complicated question of what is depression and anxiety? How do we think about these terms? So I'm a psychiatrist. I teach in a medical school, and I also teach in a divinity school. But I'm formed to use labels like depression, major depressive disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder. Lots of other, other diagnoses that I give out all the time. Those of you, some of you know, those of you that are psychology majors and maybe others know that we get a lot of these labels like major depression and generalized anxiety from this big book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. How many of you have heard of the DSM? A lot. Very good. So it's an important book. There's a lot in it. It's a big, thick book with hundreds of different diagnoses. And a lot of the language that we use in our culture to talk about emotions that aren't welcome or behavior that's not welcome, we get from the DSM. So words like bipolar disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and major depression and generalized anxiety, they come from the DSM. And it, it really sets the frame for a lot of the way that we think about our own experience. Even if you're not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a therapist, you're, you're used to using this language. So it's not a, a mistake that the organizers of this meeting called it caring for anxiety and depression and not say caring for um, trials and suffering, which would be non-medical ways of describing maybe some of the same things. We naturally use the language of anxiety and depression. So I want to think a little bit about how are labels like this useful and how might they sometimes maybe get in the way. At their best, labels like major depression and generalized anxiety can be actually life-giving and useful because they, they teach us, they tell us that we're not alone. So when I go into a therapist's office and I say, uh, I've just been feeling horrible and I don't know why, I feel like I've just like lead weight all over me, I'm not sleeping well, I'm, I'm get, waking up early in the morning even though I feel exhausted all the time, I'm sad, I, I, think, I think maybe I'd rather be dead than alive. The therapist can look at me and can say, I, I know what you're going through. We have a word for this. It's called depression. And you're not alone. And we actually see a lot of this. And, and there's things that we can do to help. Here's, here's a, a, a mode of talking, of, of talk therapy or psychotherapy that can be really helpful for you right now. Maybe here's a medication that can be helpful for you right now. And it, if I hear that, then that can be really freeing because I'm like, oh, wow, it's not just me. I'm not alone. And, and, and there's help for me. And that can be really helpful and, and life-giving. So diagnoses can be really positive. But diagnoses can also sometimes get in the way. I think it's, it's important to see both sides of it. Diagnoses sometimes can get in the way because sometimes the diagnoses themselves are just not that great. So the diagnosis of major depressive disorder, which we often just refer to as depression, people within psychiatry have had some criticisms of because it's so broad. It, it lumps together a lot of different kinds of things. It lumps together people who seem to have very biologically mediated forms of depression that come on just for no apparent reason. It lumps together people who have experienced trauma of various sorts and are just weighed down and experiencing mood symptoms from that. It lumps together people who are just in really difficult, hard situations and cycles and social situations. And maybe these are different kinds of things that are all lumped together into the same term. Also, sometimes the labels can seem very individualistic and maybe even reductionistic. So if I'm diagnosed with depression or with anxiety, it, I might think that the problem is with me, or maybe it's with my brain, that, and I need to go and get help individually, that it's not anyone else's problem, it's my problem. And there's truth that mental disorders are in the brain. You know, advocacy groups like to talk about how mental disorders are, are brain disorders. They do show up in our brain, just like anything that relates to our emotion or our, our thoughts or our behavior somehow shows up in our brain in this life. But, but it's not necessarily true that they start there. You can ask questions of anxiety and depression and lots of other mental disorders as well. Are these brain disorders that show up in social and relational and interpersonal ways? Or are they social and relational and, and cultural disorders that show up in the brain? You can see them sometimes either way. In other words, if I'm, if I'm anxious, it might not actually be that, that my brain isn't working right. My brain may be working just as brains are supposed to work, 
but what's happening is I'm in a toxic social situation, or, or my perception of the situation is, is, is causing me to, to respond with extreme anxiety. But the problem may be outside of me and not just inside me. And sometimes diagnoses can get in the way because they can become identity. So I work at, at a VA hospital. I work a lot with returning combat vets. I know how important it is for, to have a, a veteran who's returning from war who doesn't know why he's struggling to keep a job, who doesn't know why it's hard to keep a relationship, who's not sleeping, who's always jumpy, who's staying at home, who, who can't seem to, to leave the house, to be able to say, I have a name for what's happening in your, in your life. It, we call it PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. And you're not alone. And there's, there's help for you. And that can, be, that can be freeing. But I sometimes see vets who've been diagnosed with PTSD or something like it for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, who get to where they, they can't think of themselves apart from that diagnosis. So they'll come in and say, my PTSD is really acting up this week. And I need to have a different dose of medication, for example, because my PTSD is worse. And I understand that. And yet at the same time, it's like, well, well what happens when we can't any longer imagine our, our, our emotional life apart from the, the language of diagnosis? So I want to recognize that diagnosis can be helpful but diagnosis is not our identity. So what is our, our identity as Christians? How do Christians understand identity? Christians affirm pretty strongly that you're not just a random collection of neurotransmitters left to make your way in the world. You're also not just a set of symptoms to be medicated away or, or psychologized away. You are a wayfarer, a pilgrim, a, a, a person on a journey from God, who is your creator, and to God, who is your final joy. The Christian story says a few more things about who we are as human beings. It says that we're good and beautiful creatures of God, that God loves us, God loves you. And he loves not just like part of you, but he loves all of you, your, your body, every part of your body. You're not just a soul that happens to inhabit a body but you're an embodied soul, an ensouled body, who reflects God's image and God's, God's glory. And God created us, God created you for a relationship. Not just a relationship with God, but relationship with others too. Whole, whole and healthy and, and fulfilling relationships. And yet, the world that we see all around us is often not whole and healthy and fulfilling. It's often broken. The world is broken by trauma, by sin, by, by ignorance, by, by injustice, by, by various things that, that threaten our ability to, to, to know God's flourishing, to know God's life. The world that we find ourselves in, good and beautiful creatures who are on a journey, and yet sometimes that journey, the way, doesn't seem clear at all. Christians affirm that God has not just left us there to flounder, but that God loves us and united himself to us, to our bodies, to our flesh, in the person of Jesus, and invites us into his life, the life of Jesus, in order to get back to God from whom we came. So we're pilgrims on the way to God, and Jesus is the way to God. This is, this is what the Christian story affirms of who humans are, what our identity is. Now, if you want to know how therapy, maybe medications, maybe medicine, relate to us as human beings, or even if you want to think about how friends relate to each other, how any of us relate to each other as human beings, it's this. We relate to each other as people who come alongside wayfarers, pilgrims on a journey. All of you are on this journey. And whenever you want to walk alongside someone else, it's coming alongside someone who's on the way, a pilgrim on the way, and saying, hey, what is it that you need right now for the journey? And when somebody is, is depressed, or when somebody is really anxious, that could be any number of answers. It could be that someone needs, needs the, the close, careful attention of a therapist or a counselor. It could be that someone needs a medication, or maybe not. It could be that someone just needs a, a good, community that, that, is, that, that brings them in and that, and that is that, uh, kind of life to live together. The question is always, what does this person need 
for the journey right now. And this is your question as well. If you're feeling like you don't know the way, having people that come alongside you can help you figure out what do you need right now for the journey can be helpful. So I want to leave with just four ideas for specific ways that the Christian story speaks to people who are, under, who are, who are experiencing anxiety or experiencing depression. And I don't mean this as like a simple sort of fix for anxiety and depression. It's quite different from that. But I do want to mention these, and then we can come back to them in the Q&A and the conversation. So four reminders that we're not alone. The first, and these are just remarkable things that, that the Christian tradition brings to us. The first is the tradition of lament. I'm, I'm putting this, the 13th Psalm up here. I don't know how many of you know the 13th Psalm, but it's pretty remarkable. We think of the Psalms often as these very joyful, you know, get, you got it together kinds of things that we, we, we um, sing together, or they, they become the lyrics to praise hymns and praise songs and that sort of thing. But a lot of the Psalms are what we call Psalms of lament. They speak not of when things are going really well, but they speak of when things are, are not going very well. Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I've overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. Does that sound at all like depression to any of you? It does to me. The remarkable thing about the lament psalms is that they're there. And they're there as a, a kind of statement of faith. To, to, to pray this psalm is to pray, the, 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 uh, is to be faithful and, and, and to call out to God in a way that, that the, that's right there in the heart of the Bible. The psalmist goes on and says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord for he has been good to me. Notice, though, that the, the initial answers to those questions, how long, are not actually answered. God never seems to show up in this psalm. And yet, because of a memory of that God's been good to me, or God's at least been good to us as a people, it, it, it gives the ability to keep on asking that question. The Lament Psalms are important because they're, they're there. And, if, and it's not just Psalm 13, it's Psalm 88 um, that, that actually doesn't end uh, happily. You've put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all of your waves. Or Job, or Jeremiah, or Lamentations, or Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, but find no rest. Does that sound like depression or anxiety? It does to me. And this last, that last psalm is important because it was the psalm that Jesus prayed on the cross. Christians believe that Jesus made the human cry of lament, given to him in the psalms, his own cry. And so he brings our own lament and our own pain right into the heart of God. This is who Jesus is. We think of Jesus often as somebody who was kind of always kind of telling other people how to act and a pretty happy, joyful guy, but Jesus knew what it meant to be alone. He knew what it meant to be alienated. He knew what it meant to be lonely. He knew what it meant to be stressed. He knew what it meant to be exhausted and hungry. He even knew what it meant to be diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. If you look at Mark 3, Jesus was out preaching, and he comes back to his hometown, and it says his family restrained him because people were saying he's gone out of his mind. Now, that's not to say that Jesus met criteria for any of the DSM mental disorders. I don't know. But it is to say that he knew what it meant for people who had known him the longest and, and loved him the, the best to not understand him and to say, there's something wrong with you, and, 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 and to, to not get him. And, to, and he knew what it meant. So if you are carrying a diagnosis of some sort, you don't quite know what that means, well, know that, that Jesus, Jesus was there too. He, he knew what that was like. And yet, this God who joins us in our suffering is the one who in his resurrection has defeated sin and defeated death and who calls us into his life and doesn't leave us alone. So the third thing is that in community, 
Christian community is not just a group of people who get together to remember what Jesus said a long time ago, but the New Testament is very clear that Christian community is the body of Christ, that, 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 that the Christian community is, is Christ's hands, is Christ's arms, as we continue to live together, to support each other, to eat with each other. I think eating together is one of the most important things that Christians do with each other. If you think about all the things that happened in the New Testament when Jesus was eating around a table with people. They, really great things happened. People would come in, uh, people were included, lives were transformed, and Jesus actually made eating together arguably the most central Christian act at the, in, in the Last Supper when he, he instituted this, this meal that Christians celebrate together in remembrance of him. So it's not just worshiping together or doing Bible study together, but it's living life together. That's, that's an extension of, of Jesus' body and, and centrally important in a culture that's so often marked by loneliness and, and feelings of being sort of separated from other people. And last, that eating together is leading somewhere. It's not just that we eat together now or that we remember what Jesus has done, but it all leads up to what the book of Revelation calls the the marriage supper of the Lamb. This great feast that we can't actually even begin to understand, but that's given to us to imagine. The book of Revelation says, uh, speaking of, of, of God's creation when everything is made new, he says, I, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God as a bride adorned from her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among men and women. He'll dwell with them. They'll be his peoples. God himself will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain, and I might say depression and anxiety, will be no more either. There's hope there. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. I don't know exactly what that means for us. I do know that if you are anxious or if you're depressed right now, or if someone you love is deeply anxious and depressed, and you can't glimpse that future, know that it is there and it is coming. You don't have to feel it right now. You don't have to see it right now. But joy is waiting for you. Thank you. I am... Um... I want to thank everyone for being here tonight and having the opportunity to, to uh, listen to Dr. Kinghorn's perspective from his very unique perspective as both uh, a theologian and a psychiatrist has devoted much of his life to understanding the human condition and understanding that in the context of how it fits in both our spiritual lives, our, our cognitive lives, our emotional lives, and what sense do we make of that? And the opportunity to share that together in this community. I just really appreciate your time. And thank you for your valuable time and energy. And thank you for the opportunity to put this together for us to, to have a conversation. Due to the time of tonight, one of the things that's most important for me is for us to make sure that we open it up for a conversation to hear your thoughts and hear your questions. So my time will be very brief, even though I have a lot of questions that I would love um, to spend the rest of the evening and into the wee hours of the morning talking with you about. I'm going to keep mine very brief to just a couple of minutes uh, to, to continue this conversation, if you don't mind. Um, but then open it up to those of you that would like to ask questions. The format of how we want to go about doing that is using a little bit of technology. And so I think you have information that you've been handed out on the flyers. But I want to reiterate the number that we would like for you to text. If you have any questions, please text your questions to the number 607 444-1789. That's going straight into a Google Doc that's right here in front of me that I can look at and I'll be reviewing and, and bringing this. They are going to be anonymous and the Veritas form will not keep your numbers, uh, your phone numbers. So this will be an anonymous opportunity to ask questions that are important for you and to get feedback from Dr. Kinghorn. So again, thank you for the opportunity for us to have a conversation with this. I'm just glad I'm not in charge of the Google Doc. That's yeah, well, me neither. And this may fail miserably, so I may just ask people to start raising their hands anyway. Um, one of the things that I'm most interested in from your perspective is to kind of follow up on two messages that you mentioned. Is The, the first that came out was, you are not alone. 
and to recognize the, the isolation and pain that can also often be a part of the debilitating and anxiety and depression that we can often feel. So there's this you are not alone message. And then there's this hope message. And one of the things that I'm concerned about and worry about is even though we can feel isolated, I also worry about some of the community messages that are shared among all of us. Uh, that is the pervasive judgment that we often apply to ourselves. The chronic, the chronic evaluative mindset that's always evaluating how, we do, how are we doing in comparison to others. That's just there and in the air all around us. In this message of hope, what, what room is there and what ideas do you have from both your lens of theologian and lens of psychiatrist to kind of try to infuse in our community messages of tenderness, of compassion, of grace that are all attached to hope? Yeah. Can you elaborate a little more on this concept of hope and how it relates to that? Yeah, I think, I think that's so important. As, as all of you know, College especially, and I think just adult life also in particular, can be so challenging because kind of like your whole life is ahead of you, and so you come through the, these, and you go, come through high school and you get to college and you get to a prestigious place like William and Mary, and people are telling you you can do anything and you can you, you can go to you can basically do anything with your life that you want to, and you feel all this pressure like how am I going to develop myself and am I working hard enough and you have other people that are doing really interesting and creative things, and it never feels like you're doing quite enough. And so there's this tendency just to, to feel always a little bit of a step behind. And I can say, actually, that doesn't necessarily ever fully end, unless you take yourself off of that set of expectations. I know, I know for me, just personally speaking, I was really vulnerable to that as an undergraduate, especially. I was constantly feeling, and for me, there was a little bit of, of, of um, faith was, was maybe part of the problem sometimes, because I, I had this idea that um, like, you know, I've been given certain gifts, and I've been given certain opportunities, and if I don't make the best of them, then, then I must be, um, I'm just going like, to take myself out completely of any, anything useful that God could ever do with my life, and, and I'll disappoint my family, and I'll disappoint everyone else. And I began to realize that I was living out of fear of disappointing everybody, including God and including myself. And I kind of had to learn from that, that, you know, actually, God is incredibly gracious. And the world is incredibly full of, of opportunities for us to live as full, free creatures. We don't have, there's not just one path that, if you don't follow it, that you're somehow going to be sort of, you know, off the, off the rails forever. And to, to recognize that there was actually freedom, and there was actually some space in that way, was, it was, was for me the first step in being able to think, wow, I can actually make decisions, and I can actually do things just because they are beautiful and enjoyable, and not because I feel like I have to do them or I need to be doing them at, at any given time. So there was, a, there was a freedom in that. So it was learning a bit about God's, God's grace, I think, that was really wonderful from the perspective of, of faith. I think with, with hope, it's... It, you know, hope is a funny thing because if you, if you have everything that you need or if you have everything that you could possibly want, then you actually can't really hope, at least not in the way that Christians understand hope. Because hope always means that you, there's something that you don't have that you're, that you're wanting or that you're longing for. So hope, hope entails something that's not present, that you're, you're, you're wanting and you're, you're, you're hoping for, but you don't have it yet. Matter of fact, uh, really influential Theologians like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas uh, said that in heaven, you know, there's these three uh, theological virtues of faith and hope and love that are mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. They said, you know, those are, those are for us now. Faith and hope and love are for us now. But in, in heaven, we won't, have, we won't need faith and hope anymore. We'll just have love because there's nothing else to hope for once we get to God in heaven. So hope is, hope is something for wayfarers, for us right now on the journey. And hope is also something that God gives to us and that's sometimes really hard to come by if you're anxious or you're depressed, especially for people that are really depressed. Sometimes hope seems impossible. Like just, it's just not attainable. That's where I think actually the, the function of community comes in. So when we think of hoping for someone, you know, when I, when I say I'm hoping for you, 
we often mean like I hope that you do well in this test or I hope that you do well you know in this game or you know I hope that you get into this medical school but that's not the, the, the deepest meaning of hoping for I think sometimes when people are depressed and unable to hope we can come alongside each other and say hey I know you can't hope right now but I'm gonna do the work of hoping for you I'm gonna carry you in hope for a little while and so hope is not just something that we do individually, but it's something that we do for each other, and we remind each other of that. And that, that can be literally sometimes the difference between life and death when somebody is really severely depressed or severely struggling. That's helpful. And, and to follow up with that, that sense of community, you're, you kind of allude to how do we hold each other up and how do we support each other. As I was listening to you talking, I, I just wanted to kind of think of questions that were coming to me uh, personally. And... It was kind of a two-part question. From the Christian framework that you ascribe and talk about, what level of collaborative partnering, community building, among the various Christian traditions and beliefs and faiths that are on this campus, how do we better build a sense of forging a community to help hold each other, um, for, especially in a community where there are people where it's often the first onset of a mental health condition. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is trans transformational to them, often in a concept in initially of shame. Mm -hmm. And how do, we, how do we help as a community with that? And the second part of that question is, if I'm listening to you from a non-Christian perspective, if I don't align or ascribe to a Christian or that Jesus Christ is not a part of my life, how do I find space and room for what your what your message is that could be helpful for me in working with mental health issues as well from yeah. a non-Christian perspective. Yeah, yeah, good. Either way, I think that the function of community is so important and a community that's able actually to allow for vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really hard in either Christian or non-Christian communities to sometimes make space for vulnerability because we're, we often lead with fear and the need to project ourselves in certain ways that make us think that we have it all together all the time. And that, that can happen in a lot of different ways. People have ways that they keep other people away um, through either the way that we dress or the way that we act or the way that we don't show up sometimes or the way that we show up. And, and vulnerability is, is really crucially important. I think within Christian communities, I think it's really essential. Um, I've been part of Christian communities in the past, including on college campuses, that, that have not made much space for vulnerability and have, and have, um, have you know, emphasized you know, kind of the sense that you have it all together. And uh, I think, as I've said, I think that's, that's, not, that's not the way that Jesus operated. You know, Jesus, when he drew people around, he kind, of, he kind of drew people who were sometimes really at the margins. And, and he... And even when, when he drew people that were kind of sort of thing to have it all together as the culture understood that, he tended to, to bring out parts of them that didn't actually privilege the having it all together. He, didn't, he, he wasn't, wasn't a big fan of social status, if you look at, at the Gospels. He really wanted people's hearts, which is, which is very different. So vulnerability is really centrally important. You know, I think, I think a lot of that could, I think, be, be seen in, in context all either religious or non-religious context, some of those principles would apply. And I don't have any reason to think that it couldn't apply outside of a Christian context. But I do think that the Christian community has particular kinds of resources to draw on for all these reasons that I, that I talked about. That it can, they can be particularly powerful ways in which we can support each other in ways that we can include each other in ways that we can care for each other. And uh, so I, I, um, I, I, would, I would just hold that up as kind of an open invitation to people in any particular organization or community to, uh, to find spaces where we can be vulnerable with each other, where we can support each other, where we can not feel like we have to lead with this, um, this fear of somehow being found out. Mm -hmm. That if people just knew what I was hiding, that um, they, would, they would ostracize me. Um, community shouldn't have to be like that. And Christian community can lead the way, I think, in, in not being that way. When you look at your perspective, last question, and I want to turn it over to the audience. When you look at your perspective as both theologian and psychiatrist, and you look at this time in our world, and look at this time in our world in a community of young adults, as well as faculty and staff that 
this is really one of the things I love about the William Mary community, is it truly is a community of very caring people that are very serious about what they care about. So that's wonderful fuel for anxiety and depression because part of our anxiety yeah. is that we care deeply. Yeah. How do we hold the beauty of that while managing it well? And in the context, the question yeah. I want to ask is, what do you find most inspiring about campus communities today of young adults mm. and in this day and age? And what do you worry most about? Working at Duke, and especially working at the Divinity School at Duke, where there's people, I, I teach medical students and psychiatric residents and also divinity students at Duke, and some undergrads, but not, uh, not a whole lot. Um, I absolutely love working with divinity students, because divinity students come in, I don't know how many of you sort of know seminary cultures or divinity cultures, but come in, you know, there's, honestly, you know, ministry is not uh, ever gonna be a particularly highly paid profession, and so you don't go into it for the money, you don't necessarily go into it for the security, but people go into it because they have this deep passion to serve God and to serve others, to do really interesting and creative things. And when I see people, in some ways, risking like that, you know, risking, risking our, our lives like that for, for things that they care about, that's really inspiring. I, I, love, I love working with students for exactly that reason. I think I, I, I fear, I think my fear would maybe be on the reverse side of that. I think as a, as a, so I'm a doctor and I work with medical students and residents. I'm assuming a good many of you in here are pre-med and going into healthcare, but I worry that sometimes um, with professional tracks that tend to be more secure in terms of like, you know you're gonna get a job, you know you're gonna be paid decently well as long as you get through the training program. I think medicine is like that and I think that there are other kinds of professional tracks that are like that. I worry that what happens then is you get so caught up in just doing what you need to do to get into the right school and to you know, take the MCATs and to get the right grades and your pre-med classes, for example, or it could be business school classes or whatever else, that, that, um, that you're, you're really wonderful students and getting really wonderful grades and have just absolutely fantastic recommendations and transcripts, but somehow the soul gets lost in the process and, and people can easily finish four years of undergrad and graduate school and then get into their first job and then become about you know, 35 or 40 years old and come to the point like, wh wh why was I doing all of that? Like, what, what, was I, what was I chasing after? I think that's what I worry about when I see people that are just on tracks that are that they're going so fast and so busy all the time without ever any time to stop and to rest and to just be open and alive to the, to the world. Um, I think there's a lot of, there's, there, that's a, a point that isn't specifically theological, but I think that the Christian affirmations of rest and Sabbath and of just attending to the movement of, of God in our lives, I think, is, just calls us sometimes to stop and to, to, to notice. Moving beyond the portfolio yeah. and really trying to find that integrative narrative. I would say one thing, one thing that kind of relates to that, I, I'm a big fan of a, of a medieval theologian named St. Thomas Aquinas that some of you may know of. And he had this really interesting theory of emotion that said that basically all of our emotions have to do with whom or what we love. So he had this whole, whole classification of the emotions. And he said basically, so with relationship to fear, for example, he said that you know, we, love, we love people and we love things and then we, we, um, we desire them and we, we pursue them. And when, we, when we're joined with them, whether it's a person, so my wife, or whether it's a, a goal of some sort, then when we find what we love or whom we love, we feel joy. But if we feel like we're being cut off from something that we love, if, if, if we're not able to get to it, then that, that leads to fear or anxiety. There's some danger that, that gets in the way of love. In the same way, if we, if we love something and yet there's a situation that keeps us from ever getting to what we love, then we naturally feel sad. And that's basically his theory of depression. And I really like that because it, it kind of turns it around. So instead of focusing on the, the, the negative things like feeling anxious or feeling depressed or feeling whatever, it focuses on, on kind of the opposite. So you can always ask yourself when, you're, when you feel anxious about something, what does it say about whom or what you love? What's going on with your loves? And, and that often can be really helpful in thinking through what's actually going on when you feel or I feel anxious about something or, or, or feel depressed or feel sad or feel or feel worried. 
Thank you. So let's tap into the wisdom of the audience for a little bit. How is the hope that you've mentioned secure and not a crutch? When is our confidence in this hope being real and life-changing rather than just a band-aid to our hurt and pain? How does Jesus come into the picture, and why is he so important? Wow, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. 10 words or less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, hope, Christian, again, Christian hope is not something that is, um, is easy or that promises quick, quick solutions uh, or that, uh, that, that gives easy answers. It's the confidence that in spite of what's happening right now, in spite of how we think or how we feel, that God's good future will come, that death does not have the last word, that our own failures don't have the last word. It's a, it's a deep-seated confidence that, um, that God, God, is, God is in charge. And I think how we think about that, I think, affects then directly the question of, is hope just a crutch? If, if that's true, if the, if the deepest reality of the world is that uh, God loves us and has united himself to us in Jesus and is redeeming the world and will make things right, as N.T. Wright says, will put the world to rights, then that's, that's something that we can rest in. It's not just a psychological crutch. It's not something that we pull out when we need sort of an easy way out or an easy answer. It's, it's the deepest fabric, the deepest structure of the world. And that's the, and, and to see the world as Christians do is to see the world in that way. The next question really kind of deals with kind of the dynamic tension between sensitivity to others and responsibility for others. And it's, it's a question of how do you help friends and family members with their anxiety and depression when their, when their actions hurt yourself and worsen your own mental status? Yeah, that's really that's really important. By the way, I might turn some of these questions back at you. Yeah, that's that's really important. How, how do you walk alongside someone who's really struggling when you feel like it's it's wearing everybody down and you down as well? I think that's that's it's really hard sometimes. And that's where I think that the image of the the wayfarer on the journey is really helpful. So, so everyone is 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 journeying. I mean, we're all wayfarers, and, and how we come alongside each other is always a matter of, of judgment, like what's helpful in this, at this particular time. And sometimes things that uh, might seem helpful may actually not be. I, I think in general, and, and behind that question is a very specific set of experiences that would need to be talked about in a very specific kind of way. So it's hard to give a general answer to that yeah. kind of question. But, and I'd be glad to do that afterward, whoever asked the question, but I think when we start to think about like, how you actually care for somebody who might be struggling over a long period of time, it has to be done in a way that is, um, that is sustainable and that, and that honors the integrity of dignity of everyone involved. So if you're walking alongside someone and you feel that you're, you yourself are kind of getting swept under in the process, then I think that's probably a, a sign that at least other people need to be involved. It's a, it's a good sign maybe that, that um, that you need extra supports. Maybe you need people to ask, count, ask the council of to see uh, how best to help in this situation. So, so the, the call to walk alongside someone who's anxious or who's depressed is not the call to, 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 to completely efface yourself or to, to sacrifice everything. It's, it's the call, though, to be continually present and to draw on the resources of a community. That might include professional resources, so therapists and psychiatrists and counselors. It might involve pastors. It certainly involves a larger set of people than just you. So that's, that's where I think the role of community is crucially important. And wise communities that cultivate wisdom together are, are just crucially important. Next question really kind of speaks a little bit to our culture, uh, both at, at academically rigorous institutions and in institutions where people care pretty deeply about their achievements and investing in what they do. Um, the question is, how can we balance the practical need to achieve and take advantage of opportunities we've been blessed with while also retaining a big picture perspective and not succumbing to achievement anxiety? I, I, I do want to hear your response. <laughs> to this okay. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, you guys are here with lots of expectations laid on you to achieve in certain ways and to make particular grades and to get into certain schools and to get certain jobs. And, and those are important to, um, to, to think through. But I think it's, it's also important to, to recognize that, that, again, as I said before, that just because you fail a test or you don't get a good grade in a class or you don't make an athletic team that you were hoping to participate in or don't, don't get a certain internship or something, your life is, is just not, it's not over. It's not, it's not even, it, it can seem like it, it, it can be a real setback and that, that I'm never going to achieve what I could have otherwise. But, but in the big scheme of things, we always tell our stories in retrospect. And 20 years from now, when something has happened that's disappointing and then you move in a different direction and then you might move in another different direction and then you get into a certain place in life and you look back and, and you can tell yourself, wow, I, I didn't ever expect to be where I am right now, but it's, it's a good place. And there's beauty here and there's, there's life here. I think that's, that's one of the, the things about, uh, think about the, the Christian context, that the, the, the firm affirmation that God created the world and that it's good and that God created, us, uh, God created us as good and beautiful creatures, it means that there's space and there's plenitude to, to explore and to, 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 to not be sort of locked into only one particular vision. So again, it's the question of where is your, where is your love? If the achievement is, is pursuing a kind of sense of, of call, a, a pursuing of beautiful things and a pursuing of, of life, then, then pursue that absolutely. But if, if you hit a roadblock or if, there, if something seems to be not going quite right, don't worry, it's, it's, there, there truly is a, a wider scope of possibility than we can ever imagine when we're focused into just one pathway. Um, so achievement anxiety is, is often a mask for great fear that if my pathway that I'm set on now doesn't work, that things are never going to be as good as they are right now, or they're never going to work out. And that's just not true. It's not true in human life. It's certainly not true in the way that God sees us. And I would love to know your answer to that question. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, so I would like to just say ditto, but I won't. I'll add a little more to that. It, it, and this community has heard from me ad nauseum, so I'll just simply say that part of what we've really seen in the area of struggle and in perspective, the questionnaire uses the wonderful word of perspective, but essentially what we've learned in our work and our research around flourishing is that we are the most resilient when we really lead with defining ourselves by the expression of what matters to us, the expression of our values. And what we experience from that, the achievements, the accomplishments, the relationships, what we experience matters. It does matter. But we tend to languish when we start to define ourselves by what we experience than what we express. And that where, that's where hope gets mixed in, is a loss of hope is at a place when that's sufferable it's usually at a time where we're defining hope by what we're experiencing and what we anticipate experiencing. When we switch that just a little and lead with the expression of what matters to us and define ourselves by that, the expression of our values, and then let the experience be the texture of the day, the mood of the day, we tend to flourish. We tend to be more resilient. Life doesn't foster that. Life brings the noise of the experience and the outcomes into our hears every day. It's what philosophy and what choice do we make to pull the expression to matter more, which is, I think, just a different way of paraphrasing what you just said. Yeah. 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 I have a colleague at Duke who gets up every morning, looks in a mirror, and says, I am a beloved child of God. And I don't know. If you, if you do that every day and you, and you lead with that, and that's what you see in the mirror when you first wake up, it might actually make a difference for how you, how you think of of um, you know, something not going quite right. And that, that, that makes a big difference. I think a great example of that too is, many of you have probably seen this a lot in the blogs and stuff, but in various agencies that are requiring you to change your password every 30 days, one of the things that's a new trend now is many people in the act of flourishing and mindfulness and health is they're choosing a, a password of intentionality for 30 days. So what they want to intend to do and what <laughs> matters to them, they have to write it every, every few minutes whenever they log into something. And it's, there was a great blog related to that. It's someone that was having a difficult time with a colleague. And, and his password for the day was, this person really is a good person. 
which takes a while to write out. <laughs> and, and every day if you're writing that, it, it has to matter at some level. So just don't tell anybody else what your vision of flourishing is, and then you'll... <laughs> exactly, so, yeah. exactly. So another question, if you don't mind. In, in terms of treatment for mental illness, to what extent do you lean on the spiritual, religious aspect versus the medical, psychiatric, psychological approach? And, and how do you define or find a healthy balance between those? I'm fascinated by this question because one of the things I was wondering as you were talking is the hat you wear and the lens you have is at what level does the theologian lens enter your work at the VA? And at what level does your psychiatric lens enter your world in the divinity school? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big, a big question. I think that, uh, I think that we are biosocial beings. Uh, often the word biopsychosocial is used, but I actually think that that makes things more complicated than it needs to be. We're biosocial beings. We're bodies that are engaged with other bodies and interacting with each other and with cultures in ways that makes us who we are. It's kind of part of what I meant about mental disorders can either be brain disorders that show up in a social context or social disorders that show up in a brain context. Because we're, we're always, always at that interface of our bodies interacting with each other. And, um, and, and, that, and so that can, in, in the case of when we have unwanted emotions or unwanted behavior, things that are, that, are, that are being done that we don't like, I think it's always thinking about what's going on um, at the level of the body, but also what's going on in the level of our interaction with each other, in the level of relationships and in the relationship of, of culture. And then, and then how does our understanding of ourselves as spiritual beings, meaning bodies that are related to God in a certain way, how does that come into, into play? So I don't so much see things on like totally separate spheres, like there's a physical sphere and there's a psychological sphere and a social sphere and a spiritual sphere. I see us, all these things are always at play in who we are. We're bodies relating to other bodies in language and culture. And because we're bodies who are created to be open to God, all of that is always, always has a spiritual dimension. So it's, it's not easy to answer that question to say, when do you bring the spiritual in and when do you bring the physical in? I would say, though, that, um, that always having in mind uh, that the human is, is open to other humans and open to God is, is always to be thinking spiritually about even the most physical, biological sorts of things. So for me, in my clinical work, I don't work in a specifically Christian context or faith-based context. I work at, at a VA hospital. But I'm always thinking, when, when somebody's coming to see me, what's happening with this person? Not just on the level of neurotransmitters and molecules and what medications do they need, but what's happening in this person's life and in this person's relationship? And, and how does this person understand their relationship to God? And how do I, how do I begin to think through that and begin to, to nurture that kind of fullness and wholeness? So it's not a matter of splitting off the, the human into these different spheres, but it's a matter of always seeing everything all at once at the same time, which makes that a, a, a difficult kind of question to, to, to ask, to answer. This is a challenge to kind of looking at this aspect of uh, the Christian message and, and what degree this, this brings us relief. It says, Scripture tells us that if we bring our anxieties to God, we will find peace and rest. But scripture also tells us that we will face struggles and even persecution, or like the writers of the Psalms who felt abandoned by God. With this in mind, do you feel like you may be giving false hope by preaching a Christian message of hope, peace, and rest? <laughs> if, I were to, if I were to come and to say, I have five quick steps, and if you just follow those, you will never feel anxious again, or you'll never feel depressed. Or if you're depressed, then do these five quick things and things will be better for you forever. There are, you can find things like that. I don't think that's what scripture tells us. I don't think that's what, what the, the, the best of the Christian tradition tells us. I think what it tells us is that we have a God who so loves us that even in those dark places, even when we feel broken, God joins us right there in those spaces and stays with us right there, and loves us right there, and promises that that's not the end, that that's not the, the, the final answer of our, of our existence. And there's peace in that, but not necessarily a peace in the sense that things are automatically better right at once. And there's rest in that, but not, not a rest that means that things are all better all, all at once. It's more of a, it's more of a, a vision that, 
that God is in control. So, it, so nothing of what I've said here Im, implies anything related to a quick fix. But it does speak of a God who's faithful, who will stay with us, who will join us in the dark places, and who has triumphed over death and over sin, and who will have the victory. And, and it's that, 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 that trust that, that in the end God is victorious that anchors Christian hope, even when it's not something that we feel right away. I think that's a big difference between sort of easy answers, that if you do this, here's the five-step path to you know, inner peace. Um, I think the story of, of Israel, the story of Jesus, just that's not, that's not the particular story that we inherit as Christians. But we do believe that in the end, that all will be well. And, that, and that's, a, that's a great source of, uh, we can rest in that. In a, in, a, in a deep way, in a full and a final way. This next question really gets at an issue of the fear that can be a part of wrestling with the mental health issue and also finding a community of support without losing a, a sense of autonomy in one's life. How do we address the stigma of mental health problems without outing people? There's extreme guilt and fear over having a mental health issue and having attempted suicide and I don't know how to tell people. How can I get better and trust people and not be afraid of losing my sense of agency in my life? Mm -hmm. Thank you for whoever asked that question. As I understand it, it's a question of how do you talk about some of these things without feeling the pressure then to potentially bear the stigma that goes along with, with, um, with disclosing. Uh, it's really important for communities of all sorts to make space for people to talk about these kinds of experiences. And it shouldn't be incumbent, shouldn't be required that, that just people who've personally experienced depression and anxiety and, and thoughts of suicide to be the ones to bring up the conversation. Uh, I, I would encourage all of us, uh, and, and I would especially encourage the Christian fellowships here, and I'd encourage those of you that are not Christians in, in your own context to, to find ways to talk about these things, not in the moment of a crisis when there's something that everybody's talking about, but when things actually seem to be going OK, and it's easy to forget, and it's easy to kind of ignore, make space to talk about uh, depression and to talk about anxiety. I had a, a student at Duke who did a, some interviews with some participants in some of the undergraduate Christian fellowships at Duke. And um, they, she found that these groups were really wonderful sources of support, that people felt a great deal of support. But they could also sometimes be places where people felt pressure to perform in certain ways. And what was, what was most helpful was two things in these fellowships. One was, in one particular fellowship, somebody got up and told a story one day about their own struggle with thoughts of suicide and with depression. And it was incredibly healing for others in the group. I'd say that groups could, could do that, but not wait until, not wait for somebody who has that story to stand up you know, and, 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 and take that risk, but to, to invite, invite those conversations and to make those conversations safe. Another thing is that the small groups that people would gather in, in Bible studies and in fellowship groups, those were often really intimate opportunities for walking with each other. So in, insofar as you're sitting around a table with people, as you're eating with people, as you're praying with people, or those of you that aren't Christians in other settings, again, just, just make space for people to, to talk about their stories and, and make it safe. And don't, don't make it such that somebody has to take a huge risk to talk about something that there's been this code of silence that nobody's talking about. I think always making space for people to be able to talk about experiences is a, a good way to go. Thanks. I, I'm trying to alternate a little bit between uh, the psychiatric perspective and the theological perspective with some of these questions. And switching a little bit, uh, a wonderful question that, that looks at this issue of suffering. Is illness a result of being born into a broken world? Or did God choose to create us with disease for his purpose? Mm. We don't have any perspective on a world that isn't broken. Uh, the world that, we're, that we are, are born into and the world that we know is a world post-lapsum that's already, that's already broken and already fallen. So the, the gospel speaks to us in that place. And so I think that the question, as I understand it, with is, is can we think outside of the world that we find ourselves in to make judgments on what God would have wanted? And I think we just don't have that kind of access to, uh, 
to, 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 to the world. So I, I have to say that I, I, I'm very reluctant to kind of get outside of the world that we find ourselves and make judgments about sort of God's absolute purposes in creation. Um, so I want to be kind of humble about that. I do, want to, I do want to suggest, though, that God is, um, is not the author of evil. God's not the author of disease or of, or of sin. That, and this is a deep um, question within the heart of Christian tradition uh, that, that the great theologians through, through the ages have, have thought about uh, in very deep and complex ways. Um, rather than going into all of the answers to that question of how did evil arise, I want to suggest that the world that we know is a world that's already broken. And the, and the, the gospel as it comes to us is not um, giving us sort of absolute answers to uh, God's purposes in creation, but it's giving us uh, a God who comes to us in those broken spaces and wants to redeem us and wants to save us in the midst of that. Mm. Good. This is um, just a wonderfully human and honest, a fully human and honest question that I just really appreciate. Being depressed makes me extremely irritable. <laughs> Thus, I often feel guilty for snapping at friends or secluding myself from them. How can I combat this issue and continue to love others while feeling so depressed myself? Yeah. Yeah. These are, these are such good personal questions. I wish, wish whoever was asking that we could be in, in further conversation. I think you're right. When you're depressed, you just don't, it's just really hard to maintain even social appearances sometimes. You just don't want to do anything. It's hard to, hard to be in community with others and hard to know kind of how to, how to respond and what to do. And uh, I'd say that's, that's where just grace in a community, even if it's a community as small as a group of roommates or a group of friends, it's just really important for, to have, have compassion on each other for times when maybe we're not at our absolute best and maybe we just need some space from each other and being able to talk about that. So talking about it when things are better and also talking about it when things aren't, aren't so good. I don't think there's any absolute answer to that. It's, as much as just uh, being open and honest with each other in community and in friendship and to hold each other um, sometimes accountable when things aren't going well and, and to celebrate when things are going well is, um, is, I think, the human way to go. Yeah. This question talks about the community of support. How do we help each other? How do we hold each other? And it really is a, an honest question about what do we do and what do we not do. And the question is, is there anything you would recommend we not do or say to someone who's struggling with depression and anxiety? Yeah. I might turn this back to you as well. Obviously. Yeah. Well, what not to do or to say to someone who's struggling with depression or anxiety? Um, you don't want to give easy answers, uh, as if somebody couldn't um, think for themselves about what is going on. So you don't want to say, oh, it's going to all be OK, or um, just, um, just trust God more, or just uh, think of the positive things, because uh, that's really not what people need, especially in more severe forms of anxiety and depression. What people need more than kind of easy or trite answers, because that can just increase guilt, because people sometimes know that certain things are right, but they still don't feel any different. And so just the, the knowing that whatever someone says might be right, but not feeling it can just increase the feeling of guilt and separation. I think patient walking alongside is just absolutely crucial uh, to give people space to, um, to maybe not feel well, but to remind people. It, again, it's back to this question of we can hope for each other. We can, uh, we can support each other in ways that, that just patiently walks alongside. So I think expecting people to be better quickly is usually just going to intensify uh, maybe guilt and shame, and it's just not going to work very well. Uh, expecting people to, um, to give a kind of rational account of everything that's going on with them may, may not be the best, because we actually, at those times, don't our, our rational minds are not particularly well connected to what's going on with our emotions and our, our bodies, but more just creating this space for somebody just to, to sit. One, one uh, tradition that I just love, some of you know of, is a, um, a, a Jewish practice, but it, it, I think, could easily apply to Christians as well, of, of sitting Shiva when somebody is grieving. I don't know if you even know this, this practice, but it's described in the book of Job. Job's friends, before they, um, 
before they got themselves in trouble by talking, did this, where, where you know, Job was grieving, and grieving his family, and then grieving himself, and his friends came, and they sat with him without speaking for seven days. And they just sat there. And still in some Orthodox Jewish communities, this is what people do. They, they just sit with somebody who's grieving. And don't require the person to speak, and don't make conversation. Just sit and respond to what the person needs at the time. If you look at what happens in the book of Job, look, read Job 1 through 3 tonight, those of you that are interested, and you'll see that, that when Job's friends came, it allowed Job to be able to say things and to be able to express things that he might not have been able to express before. Uh, what, what Job says in Job 3 might be a result of his friends having sat with him for a week. If you, if you, if you wonder what I'm talking about, look, read, read the, the book tonight. Sometimes just that practice of just sitting with somebody and responding to what they need in the moment, of allowing people to make conversation or not. But, to, but, but the central message is that regardless of what you say or what you don't say, I'm right here with you. Or better off, we're right here with you. We're not going to let you go. We're going to walk alongside you. And we're not going to, to drop you. That's a really powerful sign of love. The investment of your time and energy and the investment in these wonderful questions. What I'm going to invite us to think a little bit about, it's, we have about five minutes left, and yet there are some wonderful questions here. And so I want to invite us, if you're okay for us, to maybe go another 10 minutes instead of wrapping up right now and just to explore this a little further. Hopefully you have the time to, to remain with us and be able to continue this conversation. Uh, in terms of following up with what you said, um, Warren, I think one of the things that I think is most important is when trying to help someone that is struggling with depression and anxiety is actually to try to pierce that notion of trying to help, is to try to, to resist that notion of how can I help, because that puts us in such a solution-focused, fix-it type of pressure and responsibility when really the most important thing is to be there and to be fully there and to be fully engaged and attuned, and to even ask at times, and just to own what your thoughts and questions are, to be able to own, I'm worried, I'm scared, I want to know, I want to understand. How can I be of best support for you? That's being the best support at that point in time, and it's okay being clumsy in it. Being yourself and being clumsy in that worry is so critically important, instead of worrying too much about how do I help. We spend the first year of graduate school dispelling, dispelling that notion of graduate students. It takes a full year to get them out of that mindset of trying not to lead with how can I help instead of how can I learn, how can I better understand is so important. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with that. I think that just simply being present with somebody is a powerful way of, um, of, of conveying you matter um, and uh, your experience matters to me. It doesn't have to be this model of, of somehow fixing. I agree with that. Yeah. Can you can explain how becoming a Christian supplies someone with real power to make concrete progress in battling depression and anxiety? What is that linkage, in your opinion? I, I'll just speak in the first person, I think, and I think everybody in here who is a Christian may have a different account of this in, in terms of what's happened in their own life. Um, for me, being a Christian has enabled me to, um, to see the world differently. I think of, of becoming a Christian as, and I'm, I think about people that have, have taught me and things that I've learned, being a Christian is less about uh, learning a set of kind of rational truths, although there's aspects of that. It's, it's not even about... Um, it's more about learning to see the world in a different way, to learning a different language, and, and learning to, to speak and to feel and to see in a different way. So for me, being a Christian has, has allowed me to, in my case, I'm a psychiatrist trained in, in sort of highly medical models of thinking about um, emotion and illness and pathology, formed to think of the body in particular ways as a physician. And to be a Christian has really helped to think outside of that, that wow, Christians affirm that the body is this, this beautiful creation of God that's open to, uh, to, to God and to God's life, and, and that God's active and present in the body. And so the body takes on new significance in, 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 in Christian life. 
the body's no longer just this collection of, as I said before, like neurotransmitters and molecules and cells, but, but the body is, has, has spiritual significance, is, is holy in some ways, and, and bears the image of, of God. So how, do, how I treat uh, people is related to how I see the world as a Christian. How I think of myself is related to how I see the world as a Christian. So it's, a, it's just a different way of seeing. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard, to, hard to fully account for it until you're inside and, and, and growing and exploring and, and seeing. I'd say being a Christian has, um, and, and, and by that I mean um, ex- accepting the, the, the good work of God in Jesus and, um, and opening ourselves to God's life. There's a, there's a deep sense of, of rest and of, of grace that isn't present all the time. It's not that I personally never get anxious or, or depressed or that certainly that Christians don't. It's not a kind of panacea against that. But it's a deep sense that, um, that we're participating in, in, in a life that's not fully ours, that we no longer have to sort of individually determine our own lives, but we're invited to participate in God's work in the world. And that, at its best, can be powerfully freeing because all of a sudden, my life is no longer just about me and just about what I want from it, or just what, what my parents want, or what, what you know, what others want of me. But but I'm invited to participate in this, in this this work of God, and uh, and so it allows me to take certain kinds of risks because it's not just about me. It's about it's about who I'm who I'm formed to be and who I'm claimed to be, uh, in baptism and in grace. This kind of addresses the issue of potential fracture of community and how we work with that and work to try to heal in that. It's how do you answer Christians who say that mental health problems are just a lack of faith or a punishment for sin? And how would you encourage people to find peace in Christ if they've really been hurt by the church or really been hurt by their Christian friends and family? The church is absolutely not a perfect community, as anybody who's participated in any form of church knows. And uh, the church can actually be quite abusive in, in some cases. And, uh, and so it's, it's not that churches are somehow immune from, from all of the kinds of brokenness that we're all susceptible to. Um, if, if you are in a situation where you've been hurt in the context of the church, then I think, first of all, um, Naming that for, for what it is is really important. And, um, and being able to talk about that with others and being able to process that with others is really important. And uh, insofar as, um, as in, in some cases, that might be something that can be um, rectified or that can be brought to, to rights. And in some cases, that's not the case. But um, and I think, there, again, there's no abstract answer to that question, except that in individual cases, um, this is a deep, a deep problem that sometimes people in the context of Christian community can, can, be, can be hurt and can even be abused. In that case, I think, know that, um, that God's work in the world and in the church is, um, is not contained in that experience. And seek out a different community. Seek out people who are wise who can help you think through how to heal from that and how to move beyond that. Uh, don't give up because of those experiences. And I know that there's a an individual painful story behind that question, and I'm glad to talk about that in, the, in a more individual way. In your professional opinion, two more questions, last two. Um, your work in psychiatry, your, your work in trying to understand mental health and understand also mental illness, do you think depression is something you can one day overcome? Or is it something that one will constantly battle, though it may, be, may get easier or get easier to face over time? I think that depends on what you mean by depression. I think, as I said before, I think when we say the word depression, we mean a lot of different kinds of things. I think some, some forms of depression are very situational. They're related to just particular phases of life or particular kinds of community. and. Uh, Changing that can actually be really helpful. So it's not necessarily something that one struggles with all, all, in all of life. Some forms of depression are more kind of biologically, I think, mediated. And uh, those are, I think, relatively rare com- compared to the number of people that are diagnosed with some form of depression. But in that case, then some ongoing um, medical treatment is actually probably wise. 
uh, to prevent relapses of depression. So again, these are, it's difficult to give a one size fits all answer. I would say one thing, and this is, um, I think about the example of someone like Abraham Lincoln, for example. There's a great book, uh, not a theological book, called Lincoln's Melancholy, which uh, talks about Lincoln. Lincoln almost certainly experienced what we would today call major depression, at least twice in his life, once in 1835, once in 1841. And each time, if you, just, if you look at it from, from our modern lenses, he met all of the criteria for major depression. He thought of suicide. His friends took away his knives and his guns. He had to stay in the care of others for a while. He was pretty much totally unable to care for himself in the context of particular losses. Lincoln, though, lived at a time, and the, this, this book by Joshua Schenck, Lincoln's Melancholy, makes this argument. Lincoln lived at a time before we had the modern diagnosis of major depression, so he wasn't diagnosed in that way. What he was diagnosed with was melancholy, or melancholia, which was an older term that was used to describe depression. And the thing that makes melanch melancholia different from modern depression is that it was understood not just as a, um, as a pathology, as an illness to get rid of, but it was understood as actually a source of, of wisdom and of creative strength. It wasn't something to be welcomed, but it was not something to be dismissed immediately. And, and biographers of, of Lincoln make a good case that it was in part because of his tendency toward depression, his melancholy temperament, that allowed him to become the kind of leader who eventually could play a, a particularly important role as president in the particular way that he did. So all to say, those of you that, ha that feel like you have a tendency toward depression, uh, it may not be that that's only a, a curse or that that's only a weakness or only something that, that needs to be somehow uh, you know, dismissed and, and that you try to get rid of. There might be actually wisdom there. I think actually many of the saints uh, that, that we celebrate in the Christian church have knew what it was like to, to, to feel depressed, and that was itself a source of creative wisdom. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, is there anything from, the, from your ability to kind of share with us your experience and in listening to the questions that have been asked, and you've done a great job of fielding them and, and answering right on the spot, Tough questions, hard questions, and for many of them, they're very individualized as well. Is there anything that you would like to leave us with at the end here that are points and takeaways that if I could share one more thing with the group, this is one thing I would like to share. Is there one or two things you'd like to share with us? Yeah. Thank you for asking that. Thank you all so much for being here tonight and for giving your time and for I'm glad to stay around afterward if people have individual kinds of questions. Um, I, I appreciate the support for the Veritas Forum and, and all the people here at William & Mary who've done this. Uh, I, I find that, um, so we've been talking for the last uh, period of time about anxiety and depression, and when you focus on those, those hard places, then typically the conversation tends to stay around those hard places. And, and that's really important to name anxiety and to name depression, to think about how we care for each other, how we walk alongside each other in those places. But there's a flip side to that, which is to think about, uh, about health and wholeness and flourishing. And I'd encourage all of you to not only think about mental health in terms of, the, in terms of naming these experiences of, of sadness and of anxiety, but, but to think about what is it in my life that, where I find, where, that I find particularly life-giving, where, where I feel that my soul is, is being fed and being nurtured. And probably the, one of the most interesting questions that we can ask ourselves is, where is it that you find joy? Joy is, is a term that often we don't use in the clinical world, at least I don't, Dr. Crace may more, more often than I do. J joy is, is a hard thing to know what, what to do with, because when I say, where do you find joy? It's, not, it's different from asking uh, what makes you happy or what gives you pleasure. There's something about the word joy that calls forth something deep in us. Uh, Christians understand joy as, as the resting of love in that which is beloved. That's St. Thomas Aquinas' understanding. The joy comes when we love something or someone and we pursue and we, we are able to rest in that. So the joy in uh, the Lord and God is, is a resting, having, having, having God having shown us God's love, we're drawn toward God, we find God, and we can rest there. And that's, that's our Christian joy. 
But where do you find joy? I'd encourage all of you to, to ask yourselves that. And the answer to that question, I think, will have direct relevance and implication for how you respond to the flip side when you feel anxious or when you feel depressed. Thank you, Warren. I know that for all of us, there's so many people in the room tonight, and one of the things I would like to encourage all, all of us to think about in terms of how this can help with community is if you would take a few minutes tonight to just think of one takeaway from this evening that would be helpful to you and your well-being, and one takeaway that you think would be helpful for you in your role as a community member. I think that can have a lot of power for this not fading and the helpful messages that we hear tonight and the hopeful messages we hear of how that can help us let this continue on in the community. So one thing for you and your well-being, one takeaway that could help us for our community. I'll do the same, and I know that that can have an impact for us. I really want to thank you for your time and your expertise and your care about our community, to be thoughtful, uh, to share your experiences with us. I especially want to thank the words that were coming to me from the computer, from, from Anna and Brian, and those of you that were been really helpful with this. Um, thank you for, for your the, time. For all the students who have been working so hard to get this event together. It's really this was a, Yeah, this was yeah. really their, their victory in this. So thank you so much, and thank you. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.